allora prenderà la parola il professor Brownwald che terrà la sua Lectio Magistralis. So this is a uh, can you leave the lights on please? So this is a uh, very special honor. It is um, a great honor because this is such a distinguished university, one of the oldest universities in the world, uh, with such a very strong cardiology department. So I want to thank uh, the distinguished chancellor, distinguished dean, uh, my appreciation to the mayor, uh, to the hospital director, and to the leadership of the modern Modena Military Academy. Um, as you heard um, from the Dean and from uh, Professor Modena, I have been uh, very fortunate in that I have uh, been in the right place at the right time. Uh, but what they didn't mention is uh, that I have had and still today have the most wonderful colleagues and uh, uh, this has been really the reason that I'm before you today. This has been an extraordinary adventure in cardiology now which for me began as a medical student um, uh, 54 years ago uh, when I became interested in the field and uh, uh, throughout this time I've had extraordinary teachers but most especially uh, having uh, very exciting uh, colleagues and uh, junior colleagues. So my task uh, is, uh, Professor Modena gave me uh, 25 minutes to discuss this little subject, uh, cardiology, the past, the present, and the future. Um, and um, uh, this is going to be uh, not a... Uh, a view from 50,000 feet, but it will be more a view from the space station. And from the space station, as you know, uh, the only thing that can be observed that is man-made is the Great Wall of China. And then sometimes uh, the photographs from the space station also uh, uh, show the um, um, uh, the lights of some of the larger cities uh, on Earth. And that's all that we can do today. So, what I would like to um, uh, mention very briefly, uh, because I do want to concentrate on the future, is to list for you uh, what seem to me to be the ten greatest achievements in cardiology of the 20th century. And the profession, the subspecialty, really began in 1903 when a professor of physiology in a small city in Holland, in Leiden, William Eindhoven, uh, de uh, developed the first ECG machine. And that really defined, for the first time, cardiology as a specialty. For many years, Cardiologists were defined as doctors who could interpret an electrocardiogram. It was that simple. And then, um, uh, moving progressively in forward in time, uh, a great experiment uh, in 1913 by a, um, a um, Russian, young Russian scientist, Nikolai Anichkov, on uh, cholesterol-induced atherosclerosis experiment in rabbits. Uh, that did not have an impact on cardiology for about 50 years. Uh, the experiment was done, but we cardiologists were not smart enough to take advantage of it for a long, long time. I'll say more about that in my lecture on atherosclerosis tomorrow. Then came cardiac catheterization. Uh, Werner Forstmann was a young uh, uh, 
resident in urological surgery in uh, Germany who uh, performed catheterization on himself. It was really a stunt, but uh, it was a smart stunt, and he was smart enough to report a single case. And um, then Kurnan and Richards uh, picked it up uh, to study cardiovascular physiology in earnest, and these three outstanding uh, clinical investigators were rewarded with a Nobel Prize in 1956. Uh, cardiac surgery, I would identify uh, uh, Robert Gross, professor of uh, surgery at Harvard Medical School, who uh, ligated a patent ductus arteriosus in 1938, so it's not strictly cardiac surgery, but we have to call it cardiovascular surgery, but that really started the ball rolling. And um, uh, Professor John Gibbons uh, at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, who developed the first heart-lung machine and actually did the first successful uh, operation on a patient, a 19-year-old girl with an atrial septum defect uh, in 1953, and that served as a tremendous stimulus for the development of heart surgery. Echocardiography, uh, Professor Tajik will say something about that, and uh, I would give uh, credit to um, Hertz and Adler, a, a very important collaboration um, uh, by these two uh, Swedish scientists. Hertz, appropriately named, um, uh, a physicist, and Edla, a cardiologist in Sweden. Um, of course, uh, uh, coronary arteriography uh, really um, uh, found accidentally, discovered accidentally by Mason Solons at the Cleveland Clinic in 19 and coronary interventions developed very methodically. Andreas Grunzik in, uh, in Zurich in uh, 1977 uh, changed the face of cardiology. Desmond Julian uh, was a resident, a registrar in cardiology at the Edinburgh um, at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1961, and he developed the idea of the coronary care unit, and uh, that was an extraordinary idea. He put different concepts together. He didn't originate any concepts. He just put them together, and within a year, uh, this idea swept the world, and the mortality from in patients who came to the hospital with acute myocardial infarction dropped in half from about 30% to about 15%. Preventive cardiology um, uh, had a, a strange beginning. Uh, Paul White, who many people consider to be the father of American cardiology, he learned cardiology, of course, in Europe, in, uh, in uh, uh, Great Britain, but he brought the first ECG machine to the United States. Boston, as a matter of fact, uh, in his uh, classic textbook in 1938, began talking about prevention. And uh, nothing much happened until 1961, when under White's stimulation, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, which, had, which when it was opened in 1948, created the Framingham Heart Study. And that was White's uh, stimulation and really genius. And in 1961, William Cannell of the Framingham Heart Study published the first paper that mentioned the terms coronary risk factors. If you go back to the 1961 paper, what did he talk about? He talked about hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and cigarette smoking. So by 1961, he had most of it, and now we have sort of been cleaning up around the sides. Cardiovascular drugs have had an enormous impact on, um, 
um, on the care of uh, patients with heart disease in the 20th century, and I mentioned just three classes of drugs, beta blockers. James Black, uh, who worked uh, for Imperial Chemical Industries in uh, the United Kingdom, also properly rewarded with a Nobel Prize for his discovery of beta blockers. Cushman and Bondetti, who worked for uh, Squibb, now Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, developed the first ACE inhibitors. And Akiro Endo, a pharmacologist in Tokyo with Sankyo, developed statins. I mention these companies because it shows how important the relationships between industry and academia are. And these are three industrial scientists who have risen to the highest level. And we see that also in devices. And uh, uh, pacemakers and ICDs, Paul Zoll, uh, a professor of medicine at Harvard, in 1952 developed the first uh, external pacemaker. And Michelle Narofsky, an Israeli cardiologist working at Sinai Hospital and at Johns Hopkins in 1970, the first implanted cardioverter defibrillator. So these, to me, seem to be the most outstanding contributions uh, of cardiology in the 20th century. Now, uh, what about the present? Uh, right now, we are seeing um, tremendous subspecialization in the pursuit of excellence. And um, uh, the goals of subspecialization, cardiology is now so large, it's so vast, that no one person can master everything. And so we have invasive cardiologists, echocardiographers, electrophysiologists, subspecialists in vascular disease, subspecialists in hypertension, acute coronary syndromes, heart failure, prevention, rehabilitation, and on and on and on. And um, uh, the goal, of course, of subspecialization is very worthy. I think it's been shown repeatedly that uh, practice improves performance. Uh, if I had to have <coughs> a, um, uh, an invasive procedure, uh, a stent placed, I wouldn't want to have it done by great cardiologists who just four a year. I would like to have somebody who you know, who's done four in the past week, and so forth. Uh, but uh, there is clearly a downside to subspecialization, and that is the fragmentation of care. Um, and we're seeing increasingly patients being bounced around from uh, one cardiologist another cardiologist, and we're seeing uh, the fragmentation of cardiology into multiple uh, sub-specialties, sub and that's something that's very important for us to consider and to work on. Finally, a few words about the future. There's, um, uh, there are many uh, tremendous opportunities uh, in the future, but I want to talk uh, what I think is the most outstanding one, that is the potential impact of genetics and genomics. And um, I want to give you just a few examples. Um, in our group, in the Timmy group, um, we have um, observed uh, that uh, back in uh, about three years ago, one of our trials, that uh, there are from pro-thrombonic variants, variants in the glycoprotein 1B2A uh, receptor, and that receptor comes in, uh, uh, there are three forms of the receptor, each encoded by a different gene, and here you can see the tremendous difference in the risk, either of patients who had already experienced the acute coronary syndrome. This slide shows the differences in risk of three different genotypes that we observe. So there is an eight-fold difference in risk between the CC uh, 
our genotype and the TP genotype. So this establishes one of the fundamental uh, characteristics that genetics is providing, namely a superior form of risk stratification in identifying patients at risk. Now, this identification can be done early. You don't have to have an acute coronary syndrome. You can identify this at birth. You can even, although it wouldn't be clinically useful, identify it before birth, because this is the genetic imprint, and that is. Now, um, a field becomes important when it makes the cover of Business Week. And this is the cover of uh, Business Week uh, um, about a month ago. And uh, it indicates that, uh, as you can see, drugs are smart. And what do they mean by smart drugs? And what this article in Business Week talks about is the use of genetic information to tailor drugs. And you can see what some of the implications are. So first, let's begin with a variant of a, an important protein, G protein. Uh, uh, this particular variant, the 825E variant, when it's present, results in about a 68% increase in the risk of stroke. That was uh, published uh, uh, about four years ago. Simultaneously, so that's the bad news. If you have this variant, you are more likely uh, to suffer stroke. But the bottom of the slide shows the good news. The good news is that if you have this variant, you respond extremely well to treatment with thiazide diuretics, which are the cheapest, the least expensive antihypertensive drugs. So you can see if you have this variant, you uh, have a marked reduction of uh, blood pressure with thiazide diuretics compared to the normal or wild type genotype. And I mentioned the cost is because, you know, we've heard from uh, um, uh, the uh, director of the hospital about, and also from the chancellor, the tremendous concern about costs. And we, in cardiology, have been responsible for adding to the costs of care. There have been tremendous advances in care, but they, up to now, most everything that we've done in cardiology has had a lot of expenses attached to it. And here is an example of if we were to do this genetic test, which would be done only once we could identify those patients who could be treated effectively with a very inexpensive medication, which of course is generic, it's on the market. Uh, and so the conclusion from this is that we should be screening hypertensives for this G protein variant and use that to select antihypertensive therapy. Another example of genetics. There has been an enormous amount of uh, publicity, not only in the medical press, but also in the lay press, about the use of hormone replacement in postmenopausal women. So, a huge public health problem, a major problem. And the overall results of the large Women's Health Initiative trial, the so-called WHI trial in the United States, has been quite negative about the use of both estrogen alone and the combination of estrogen and uh, progestins in terms of the development. But everybody is, isn't the same. 
And uh, there are two forms of the estrogen receptor. Um, one uh, would be called the CC, which is shown on the left, and the other one would be the PT or the CT. Now, it's been known for a long time that estrogens, and this is one of the reasons why people thought it would be useful to use estrogen treatment uh, to prevent heart disease, is because estrogen raise the HDL cholesterol. But it turns out they don't raise the HDL cholesterol in everybody. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you see the observation in 15% of women. In these 15% of women, the HDL cholesterol was raised by 26%, which is an extraordinary increase. Very cheap drug, Inexpensive drug, a great effect. You would expect this to have about a result in about a 50% reduction in coronary disease. That's the good news. The bad news is shown on the right-hand side of the slide, and that is that 85% of women uh, do not respond. They are the ones in the CT or TT genome, and they show very little effect in HDL. So I think that what we have, by, by saying we want to treat heart, is we don't want to say, as people said 10 years ago, is that every woman should get uh, uh, estrogen replacement. I think that was wrong. I think it is just as naive now to say that no one should get it, because 15% of the population can have a great response. Um, a very common drug that we use in cardiology all the time is uh, the anticoagulant warfarin. In the last uh, couple of years, uh, there have been two major discoveries uh, uh, of how our genetic makeup uh, uh, differs uh, and how patients differ in the response to warfarin. So this uh, C4P2C9 is an enzyme which is involved in warfarin metabolism. About one-third of the population, so one-third of the people in this room, have uh, one of two variants of this, um, uh, the gene that encodes this enzyme. And we all have seen in clinical practice that there are some patients who can be treated very effectively and easily with warfarin. Put them on a steady dose, and they remain unchanged for long periods. Uh, and they tolerate the drug well. They are very predictable. And we have some patients who bounce around and uh, whose dose seems to change, who have to be monitored very, very closely, and still they have bleeding at well, now we understand the reason that they have one of these two variants, and having in one of these variants that the maintenance dose of warfarin is reduced, the time to stable the dosage takes three months longer, and still serious bleeding is extremely common. The second major discovery was uh, actually described um, uh, earlier this year, and that is uh, there is a target gene, which encodes something called the vitamin K epoxide reductase complex, which recycles vitamin K and controls the response to warfarin. And again, you see that there are two uh, genotypes. There's the A and the B, and there's the uh, heterozygous form AB. And you can see that the mean warfarin dose for stability ranges between 6 and uh, two milligrams. So we have the capacity now to screen for these two variants. And this can improve, obviously, dosing and surveillance. It's been estimated that two and a half million patients in the United States are receiving warfarin, and their care can be improved enormously. It's also very clear that uh, Within the next uh, several years, there will be newer oral anticoagulants 
that will become available. One thing we know about the newer anticoagulants, they're just making their way through the approval process, is that they're going to be very expensive. And warfarin is extremely expensive. Again, an opportunity to improve patient care and to reduce costs. Because the majority of patients, 70%, can take warfarin without any difficulty, and they don't need to get the expensive drugs. But a third get into trouble, they get into bleeding, and they are the ones who should get the new oral anticoagulants. Um, Professor Medina mentioned um, one of the trials that our group was involved in, uh, the CARE trial, which was a trial of, um, of um, uh, a statin um, in patients uh, who had uh, a normal, or what was thought to be a normal level of um, LDL cholesterol. Um, one of the uh, fortunate things that we did in that trial uh, is uh, we uh, save DNA on our patients. This is uh, eight years ago, uh, because we hoped that uh, the technology would advance and that we would be able to use uh, and learn something from the DNA. And um, uh, it has worked out well, and so we have established a collaboration, um, an academic collaboration between our medical school and hospital a pharmaceutical company that sponsored the trial, Bristol Myers Squibb, and a genomics company, Celera. Celera was the company that um, um, was successful in the race for the definition of the Human Genome Project. Remember, there was a race between the government and a private company. Celera was that private company. And uh, so we have been collaborating and um, uh, adjusting beginning to uh, reap the fruits of that collaboration. Um, one of the observations um, that uh, we have made is uh, we all know about the importance of uh, inflammation in uh, acute coronary disease. There is a receptor uh, encoded by a gene, FCAR, and a variant in that gene uh, increases the risk of developing myocardial infarction in these patients in the CARE trial. So this is the wild type at an incidence of recurrent infarction, 13.7, and uh, it was 50% uh, higher in patients who had the variant gene. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Patients who carried this variant gene had an incredibly powerful response to the statin. This shows the uh, um, survival curves in patients with the variant gene, gravastatin versus placebo, and the difference, of course, is price spiking. Uh, virtually all of the patients on gravastatin survived. Take a look at this, uh, the um, uh, patients who didn't have the variant gene, they showed virtually no response to the drug. Again, an example of how we have to target treatment. The same way as every shoe size doesn't fit everybody in this room, that means every drug isn't appropriate for every patient. And um, the second observation, um, which um, Dr. Sabatine and our group Timmy has uh, reported on at the American Heart Association last year, is that ADEMS-1, which is an extracellular protein, which is involved in plaque stability, again, a genetic variant, uh, uh, changes the risk of the development of, uh, of um, fatal and non-fatal coronary heart disease almost doubles it. And again, and here, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to get uh, 
uh, DNA not only from our own trial, but also from the West of Scotland trial, which was a primary prevention trial, and uh, uh, by being able to demonstrate this in two populations, we feel much more confident than if we had seen it in a single population. And so you can see that in uh, uh, a small percentage of the population, uh, with this variant, 6% of the population, there was a reduction in risk by 77% with a statin. And in the absence of this, there was only a very modest 23% reduction. So um, to um, conclude, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, looking ahead into the future, I think um, uh, there are these two aspects of cardiology that we are dealing with today and we will be dealing with increasingly as we go forward. And I show this as a scale. And I show interventions, which is, uh, uh, and by interventions, I mean anything that we do uh, to a patient, whether it is putting in a stent or carrying out a procedure uh, or implanting a pacemaker or a defibrillator. And I think that uh, in uh, the next uh, several years, over, you know, maybe in the next 10 or 15 years, I think uh, interventions will increase. And so um, uh, I think that those of you here who are interventional cardiologists don't need to worry about uh, your future. And those of you who are responsible for the development of laboratories uh, and making an investment, uh, uh, I think you have a very bright future. And it's, it's because, for two reasons. Because, uh, number one, interventions will continue to become better and better and more and more useful. And because of demographics, that there will be an increasing number of people who will survive and require interventions. But at the same time, there is a greater and greater emphasis on prevention. And at the moment, I'm showing this as uh, not as powerful as uh, the interventional side of the scale. Uh, but because of the developments in genetics and genomics, few of which I've outlined, I think that will become the dominant technology and I would make the prediction that after 2020, give me five years on either side of that estimate, I think that the scales will turn and prevention will become the dominant technology. Intervention will continue. They will continue to become more and more useful. There's no question about that. And the demographic pressures are not going to go away but I think prevention will become the dominant technology. So that the principal role of the cardiologist today is to recognize and to manage established disease. And uh, by 2020, uh, it will be quite different. I believe it will be to interpret and apply genetic information uh, in the prevention and treatment of disease. The ultimate goal, of course, is to eliminate cardiovascular disease as a serious threat to life and to health. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thank you so much for this uh, very, very distinguished honor.